matching them up with the state to see how they aligned and we tweaked them as best we could. And a couple of them were just minor tweaks. They'll come before the uh, full school committee, but not before they're sent out here to take a look and to modify. And that should be coming up within the next week. Thank you. And communication. All right, our communication subcommittee met and we discussed looking at some more uh, outreach to the community with different sorts of resources with email communication and some other distribution lists so more to come on that um, but again trying to push out more information um, better than we have in the past thank you uh, we can have some public comment tonight um, two speakers i'll remind you to come up just name your uh, provide your name uh, your town of residence um, address the board generally and uh, you have about three minutes. I guess you can raise my hand with about 30 seconds left, so hopefully you know it's coming. Um, uh, Cameron, can you? Can you hear me? So uh, my name is Mike Lydia, this is my wife Erin, we live at 59 Field Road, and we have three varsity athletes, or three athletes right now that the uh, high school, uh, Bethany, Teddy, and Max. Um, and the purpose for us being here today is to address the increased athletic fees that we are uh, experiencing this year due to the override not passing. Previously, the family cap was $750. Uh, the current budget is limited to the family cap for the first time in recent memory, and we are asking that the family cap be reinstated and advocate the said cap increase associated with the other fees. To that end, we would like to see the cap remain in place and be doubled as every other fee has been done. Without such a reasonable application of a cap, 
Our Fed athletic fees will be going from the current cap of $750 to $3,550 in one year. That's an increase of $2,800 or 373% in one year. A little more than 2.5%, right? So a lot of discussion around why the fees were increased. Uh, with that they had not been raised in years and that our fees were now in line with other area schools. While it is true that our fees are now comparable to area schools, they are now higher than the average of the Cape Ann League, and they are the highest of any Cape Ann League school except Hamilton One, for multiple children and athlete families like ours. Also, um, most other Cape Ann League schools have caps, ranging from $900 for Ipswich, $1,400 for Newport, Georgetown is $1,500, North Reading is $1,300, Linfield has a $1,200 cap, Manchester Essex has a $1,550 cap. The highest cap is $1,550, $2,000 less than what we're going to be paying this year. So while we applaud the tremendous effort that uh, it took to save as many positions at the school as we're able to do, and we're not seeking to undo that great work, however, we are advocating for a 100% in increase in the cap similar to all the other fees, um, so that we're not facing such a uh, dire economic straight hardship. And if there's any time left, I'd like the chair of the PAA to say a few words. President, President, PAA. Um, <clears throat> I just also wanted to voice my concern for other families. Um, I feel like these fees, it, they are causing a hardship. I mean, I've already seen it happening. Teddy Max are freshmen, they're playing football, they're getting ready to play basketball. A couple of their friends are just not going to play sports um, because, not just because of the fees, but it is one of the reasons, and families can't afford it. I mean, we're all going through hard times. The grocery bills, everything's gone up astronomically. And I just have concern, not just for our children, but all the children. Um, that sports are very important, especially post-pandemic, the mental health crises. Kids need sports. These high school students need sports. So I'm asking you to please reconsider installing the family cap. And like I said, double it. But 343% is, is crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Patty Blankfeld, and my husband and I have twin ninth grader, ninth grade daughters. And they're so fortunate to be their first grade, first year in this beautiful new building. And I worked on the WAP committee, and along with um, all of the folks that you know, we worked really hard, and the this is the vision of that, and so it's it's wonderful to feel that um, it was a vision and it's here now. Uh, it, it took some convincing, and the reason why I'm here is because I'm an RN. I work at the NJ Hospital, and I've worked in big city hospitals in DC, but. Um, I work in the birth center and the NICU, and I know as an RN, you know, the level of care really matters. And our teachers, when when the override happened in the spring, we know that that impacted the um, the staff, and we have inadequate staff, and it's problematic. The teachers are rising up, and they're stretched, and they're resilient, and their the kids are you know, amazingly grateful, and they love their teachers, our girls. But um, I know that in the hospital, when there's inappropriate staffing, that stuff gets missed, and things get, you know, crazy. And um, you, you know, it's just really important that there's a state mandate that is um, one, one nurse to 500 children, and right now in the middle of high school, there's one RN for 963 kids. And I spoke with one of the nurses, um, not here, but in, over at Suter, and you know, she was saying that it's just not sustainable. And I feel that 
on behalf of the parents, I'm speaking because I know the teachers don't feel like they have that support. And, you know, everybody has tried to work so hard to make it, um, to fix it, but it, it's not sustainable. And so I feel that what's really important is that, um, you know, the, the social and emotional needs of the middle and high schoolers is, is really important. And the staff, if they're burnt out, you know, we're not gonna recruit and retain really wonderful teachers. And we want that. We want a robust education for our children. And that's why we moved to Kentucky and it has a great reputation. But if we start, like, if that arose over time and people are just like, you know, it's not good. So the bottom line is we're, I'm here looking to our elected officials to show leadership and take action um, to uh, remedy this critical situation. And I'll just end with if we have to, maybe we need to reinvigorate the WAP committee people. I, I think that we would be willing to go and talk with people to before May's vote so that we can um, get some support for the teachers and staff that work so hard. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to new business um, before the state of the schools. One bit of new business for uh, the school committee. Uh, and this is actually a great and appropriate night uh, to do this. It's something we've talked about for a little while, um, uh, including at a recent workshop. We decided we really wanted to move forward with something that's all it can be a little bit more proactive in reaching out as a collective body. We obviously all represent our own communities, um, but we thought it'd be appropriate to create a formal body that could sort of be responsible for um, identifying opportunities to go visit our selectmen, our FinCom, community events, whatever those opportunities are, and then we have a nine-member board to use that entire board at our disposal to maybe have a little bit more presence at those things uh, on a regular, ongoing basis. Um, and then we've turned that to the town liaisons subcommittee. Uh, so I'm open to both comments or discussion on it, or just volunteers who want to serve on it. And again, I think it's important to note that this subcommittee will guide that work. They aren't responsible for doing all of the meetings themselves. So they'll be responsible for identifying those opportunities, and then hopefully identifying which uh, board members are right for which opportunities. Marie.
So we only have possession just yesterday work on the front here just finished. Uh, completely done, but we're close. Um, the screen is not the screen we intended to use. A screen we have to use to get 20 people up here. So um, I just speculate. I can't ever reiterate what the chair said. We're so thankful that the, the board of selectmen were here. Certainly thankful to uh, Rebecca, Angus, and Carol for just working with us, sharing the thoughts um, with us that this might be a good idea. Just kind of get everybody on the same page with where things are. And you can imagine there's a thousand ways that I thought about addressing this. When you have a override and you're removing positions, you don't need back to as a children, and you're increasing fees or removing nurses, that, that, that is an emotional roller coaster for someone who has to make those decisions. That's what happened. Um, and we'll always work with what happens and put the best foot forward we possibly can. So I just want to start off by thanking everybody. If we could go around just so everyone knows who's here and where you can just say your name or where you represent. That would be great. I probably should use this mic. So, we know Chris Martin is the chair. Hello, everyone. Chris Mandy, Merrimack Board of Selectmen. Wayne Adams, Merrimack School of Division. Ben Bodia, Merrimack Board of Selectmen. Julie King, Merrimack Kentucky, Merrimack Representative School Committee. Marie Belsani, Leslie, Ray School Committee. Dave Archwell, West Newbury Select Board. Dean Estrada, West Newbury School Committee. Wendy Reed, West Newbury Select Board. Rick Parker, West Newbury Select Board. Chris Redding, uh, School Committee from West Newbury. Lana Dorosha, Groland School Committee. Kathy Castanel, Groland Board of Select Board. Ashley McLaughlin, World Wood School Committee. Emily Dwyer, World Wood School Committee. All right, so thank you all of you for being here. I think it's uh, the last time we did this, this building didn't exist. It was January of 2019. There were two topics. One topic was to just review the regional agreement, make some adjustments, particularly for contingency plans of the building failed, which at that time, both the middle school and high school were very much, uh, there was a strong likelihood that it wasn't going to happen. The same thing six sinkholes that happened between when we approved it to when this finished um, were very good indicators of that. And here we are again. And it's, the problem's the same, right? It's not, it's about kids, it's about education, it's about trying to do what we can for our community, but it's community responsibility. So to have everybody here uh, is, is, is fabulous. So just, for those of you in the, in the audience and for people here, who may not know, just the whole history, the very brief history of um, Kentucky. So, 1954, you can see that on the seal. See the seal right there? Just a little fun fact on the seal. Uh, we talked to the Kawasaki man, the Pentecook and Abenaki people, when we were talking about the mascot piece, and they said, no matter what, keep that. That is a perfect representation of what a Pentucket would have looked like, and they captured the meaning of the word Pentucket by having the winding river between the two valleys. So um, that seal, was created, I'm not sure who created it. If anybody could tell me that fun fact, that would be great. But 1954 is when Roland and West Newbury got together and said, yes, let's form this district. In 1958, Merrimack signed on. Their high school had just shut down. I understand it was condemned. And if you go to Sergeant Hall now, Merrimack, where the town meeting state place, that's where they used to play basketball. Um, in 1967, so the new high school also opened in 1957. The new middle school opened, which was junior high, and then in 1994, up until 1994, only the junior high and high school were regionalized. Each town had to run its own elementary school, and in 1994, it was full regionalization. So tonight, what we're going to do is look at the four categories. We're going to look at the academic performances, where we, where we were, where we are, and where we hope to be. The budget, same, facilities, same, the challenges that we're facing. And when I say we're facing, certainly we talk about most public education and most families facing the same thing. So from the academic standpoint, you've seen this headline all over the place that COVID has had devastating effects. I think there was sports came on recently um, about nationwide, how things are so devastatingly bad. Um, students aren't responding. COVID has a big drop off. Well, how has that impacted us here in Kentucky? We did this before with the district. We have 12 districts that we compare ourselves to, a dark district, a 
district analysis review tools. These are the districts that are similar to us in terms of their makeup, they're similar to us in population, and there's a couple we put in there as well because Georgia. We're bigger than them, they're similar than us, they're similar to us, um, but they're one of our neighbors. So it's just a, a comparison. So when we look at this data, oops, so these are the, uh, oh boy, we really fast over there. Look at that. So these are the districts where we put in our dark districts. And I admit, there's some of these districts, I don't know where they are. Um, I, you know, just function, I couldn't tell you where Keyfield is. I know where, I know where it is now. I have to look it up. It's in the south central part of Massachusetts. Um, so those are our dark districts. But there's a lot of things you do recognize. You certainly recognize Mass and Hamilton, Hamilton, one of the report North Reading, and Israel, Georgetown, and Triton. Certainly, certainly, you see those. When we go through this, the information you want to uh, know, the definitions, we're going to talk about the percent proficiency, so the number of students who met or exceeded um, proficiency, the student growth percentile. So students are to have goals. Do they meet the goal or do they fall short of the goal? And then the sales score. Sales score, we know, we know what that is. So you get a, take a test, you get a 74, okay, the average is 74, but the teacher wants to be an 80, so the sales score is 80. So the score is the actual score that students receive. So when we look at this, here's our comparison. I'll give you a second to absorb this, but this is, when it says ELA, ELA is English Language Arts. So that's your reading and writing. And this is for grades three through 10, and passing to state performance. So when you go back to 2017, what you see is that we were dead last. And there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for that that I'm not gonna get into, but we were dead last. Not a place that the school I attended should ever be. And when I see it, gets me frustrated, but it also got me excited to come here as a superintendent because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to come in, you see a problem, you know how to make the adjustments. So in 2022, based on this last year's end you can see there's a big improvement. From 10th overall in the percentage proficient, 8th in student growth, and a sales for ninth. Now, am I happy with that? Of course not. But you'll see something next slide gets better, and I'll be able to explain the discrepancy why that is not a title. So here, that was the English language arts. Here's math. So with math, you're dead last, we were dead last in everything except we were second to last in student growth. And now we're in a single digit, eight, four, and seven. Am I happy with that? No. I don't like anything except number one. I like first and everything. But I'm not going to sell out every the farm to go ahead and get there, right? So eighth fourth, that is incredibly impressive. That's five years time. Right? Five years of pandemic. Oh, so I don't know. I apologize to keep doing this, but here we go. So go ahead and read this. Mr. Conway put the slide together. There's two key numbers here. So in 2018, of all the schools in Massachusetts, we were in the 43rd percentile. In 2022, four years later, post pandemic, going through all that mess, we are now in the 64th percentile. So quick math, that's an increase of 21%. That, for what it's worth, is amazing. Sorry. So just the English language arts part. So if you look at this, this talks here about where we were compared against the state. So if we say we start off, you can see we're, we're about 4.6 points below the state in 2017. And now we're 8.3% above. Definitely a good situation. You can see we're below.
excess of 9%, and you still 10%, and right here, we're just going above in 2019, 2020, we don't have it because what happened? COVID, yeah, COVID, so we didn't have any testing. So you can see we accelerated at that time. So just worth reviewing. Academically, 21 percentage increases and compared to everyone else in the state. That is remarkable. I'll say that to the superintendent. If I was anywhere, if you someone told me, hey, we went from the 43rd percentile to the 64th percentile, I thought that's amazing. Am I, are you happy with that? Of course not. Of course not. I mean, all of us here in the audience, all of us sitting up here, we know when you see 64 percent, what letter grade do you think of? D. That's a D. Yeah, so, not acceptable. But amazing. And by the way, for children as well, you celebrate that. So if the child's at 43 percent, then you go to 64 percent. Okay, they're struggling. They're showing growth. You celebrate that. Same situation. So if everybody else is struggling, how do we succeed? A few things. And these are not all encompassing. But first thing, we knew there was an issue with curriculum. So you have to invest in curriculum. First year we put math. You aligned it vertically, you aligned it horizontally. If you're a teacher, you know what I'm talking about. You want to make sure that everybody in first grade, doesn't matter if you're World Western or you're Merrimack, is doing the same math. And that's not what had been happening. And it's not the fault of the people in the classroom either. There was just nobody, there was no guidance, there was no support, there was no system in place to address that. So first year we put in math, second year social studies, we didn't put anything in the third year. So here we weren't going to run the English language arts. The fourth year, English language arts, and this year, science is going to see the course has been put in place this year. So if you're a kindergartner this year, you're going to have all the new curriculum all the way through. If you're in 12th grade, yeah, you didn't have this. This did not happen for you. So when you think back, the bigger increase, or the bigger, bigger rating was the math. Well, sure, we put math in first. And then we put English language arts in. Um, and this really is, this is not an SAT thing where you pay someone $2,000 and they guarantee you 200 points more on SAT. This is actually has to do with student learning and understanding and decoding. Second thing, grant money, including grants we got from the town. So, yes, absolutely, from a standpoint, um, we use that money, grant money, in particular, to purchase curriculum and to be able to rely on professional development for teachers, which had not been happening. Or if they had professional development, it wasn't necessarily aligned to what the curriculum was. Why? Because it wasn't on the curriculum. But then that second dot there, that purchase technology, I know I always say this, Carol. Where are you? Carol? Carol, I say this all the time. So, Carol mentioned to me about this grant, so I looked into it, and I think it was, it was almost two years ago we had this conversation. And then I reached out to the other towns. I said, hey, here's an we have an opportunity to access money uh, for technology. Would you be willing to let us all work together? This? And all the towns said yes. Um, from that, we got $650,000 worth of technology. These are, this is technology that I did not think we would have for eight years when I first came here. And there was in year three where it's, it's on its way. Our district in particular, the infrastructure technologically was not good. So we were able to overhaul the entire, uh, all that infrastructure, because that's what we use money for, and that has been a huge help, because that also gives students access to use their devices, gives students the opportunity to have a one-to-one, -one. once you're in seventh grade, where if you don't have a laptop, we give you one. Um, those are all things we were able to do. And I think we all remember how hard it was going to library, in my case, the library, pulling out the Cyclopedia Britannica and trying to look up what the Coliseum looked like and write a report on it. Now, you just have to go on your computer, type in Coliseum, and you get all sorts of information. It's much easier. You, you learn a lot more information. And then that last part. Uh, we, we work collaboratively. We work together. You build a system that's based on support, trust, and respect. Are there disagreements? Of course there are. But we're civil to each other. We respect each other. And if you do that, people feel valued. 
And you know, today, there's far much more in the opposite direction that people are just yelling and screaming for no reason. Like everyone's just trying to get along the world, trying to get along in life, but yelling and screaming is not going to get anything accomplished. Um, so you listen to people, you hear what people have to say, and there is typically, there's this whole spectrum of right and wrong. It's not very rarely is it yes or no. The other thing about our academics, just soak that in for a second. So our senior class, 84.7% of our senior class, the 160 students, are currently enrolled in a class that's eligible for college credit. That's extraordinarily high. And you can just think, if you're a parent, your kids are going to college, you can think of all the advantages. Not the least of which was, if you went to a little rock school, you had to take a year of English, a year of math, but that's not the case now. So we have partnerships with Merrimack College, Southern New Hampshire University, and North Essex Community College. So students are able to take classes. We have several students who are graduating with an associate's degree before they graduate, walk off the stage with their high school diploma. So it's just an excellent opportunity. Of course, that does come at a little bit of cost. But academically, we are moving very much in the right direction. The question is, can you keep it going? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And math, we got to where we are. We saw the single digits. We got to where we are. And that's been since 2018 school year. So here we are, four years later, and we made those improvements. So yes, these other areas will catch up. And that's good, but only to a point. Right? So because eventually, you don't have money to provide the support. You don't have money to provide the curriculum. All of those resources that you have are gone. And when that happens, you maintain what you have, and you hope for the best. And that sounds like a weird thing to say, but it, it's the truth. You, you hope the best. You hope the teachers stay engaged, you want to do PD, but if you don't have grants to do PD, it's done. If you don't have ESSER wants to do that, it's done. But those opportunities go on exist. So the next category, does anybody have any questions about the academics? Well, this is a little lot quicker than that, I expect. So that's a category of budgets. So we're talking about budgets. This came up a few times last spring. Um, there's a big difference between an operational budget and a capital budget. Capital budget is how this was built. So you can use a capital budget to build a school building. But you cannot take money from a capital budget project and say, okay, we're going to use that money to hire custodians or to hire teachers. You can't do it. That's your operational budget. Um, and so when you see those different, you see people, so you hear people say, well, they already built a big fancy school, why do they need more money? Well, because it's a different pot of money. We can't use a big fancy school to bring in teachers or money for the school to say, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put up this screen. Instead, we're gonna buy 25 books. We're not allowed to do that. So the state assessment methodology, so a little history. We use the state law requires that we use a two-step method. That had not always been the case. Early 2000s, Kentucky had a setup where each year was relatively predictable. But there was a lawsuit that took place, so it defaulted back to the two step method. And the two step method follows the Chapter 70 formula, which means they claim it's your district, your town, your municipality, their ability to pay. You would think that's pretty consistent, but in any one year, you go from 1.5% to 7.5% to 3.5% is what the state says your increase has to be. It's very unpredictable. And just to make this super clear, super clear, because I hear this every meeting, we need to do something about the state. The state needs to change this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Is it going to happen this year? No. Not going to happen this year? Probably not going to happen next year? No one I know has interest in legislation trying to tackle that air. Everyone complains about it. But it's not going to happen. So the only out we have potentially is the regional agreement. We can come up with our own method of how we want to assess. Um, but to do that, all three towns would have to agree. Just off the top of my head, you can say, hey, we're going to all pay the exact same. So if the bill was $99, for all of them, they're paying $33. West Virginia, you're paying $33. In Merrimack, you're paying $33. You can do that. Everyone would have to agree on that, though. Um, and there's pros and cons to do that. And it's not, there's not an easy method. So as much as people don't like the two-step method, well, that's the best method we've got right now. 
to worry with God was something different. So you, you heard a couple of folks talk about the failed override programs. Uh, what, the, what, what the impact is going to fail override. So these are going to be slides that go over that. Uh, I also heard several rumors of the softball game this summer and the parents said, well, we knew you were going to take care of this. It wasn't going to be a big deal. Really? So let's take a look at what the big deal was. So we cut all freshmen G2 sports. For the middle school and high school supplies, we slashed that by $45,864. Um, Six grade used to go, and it was kind of a culmination celebration. We go to see the will be the first time to interact with other people. The district gave for that. We do not do that anymore. Seventh grade, they would go to Project Adventure. It's their first time being together in the classrooms. Um, they actually did it this year, but the parents had to, the families had to pay for it. Um, and in the district, we cut the percussion contract. We got rid of that. Um, the Pentagon. Arts Foundation actually came in and ended up covering that cost. Did they not? Music boosters. Music boosters, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Chris. Um, music boosters came in and they helped cover that. Because uh, it's a contract, we can do that, but we can't do that with personnel. And in the middle of high school, so when you see the next couple of pages, when I put here, yeah, when you cut teachers, they're teaching classes. So when you remove those teachers, all of a sudden, what's available? Shrinks down significantly. So all the electives that used to be are no more. You're cutting it down to the, to, the, to the core. So, coaches, the position, these are coaches, you can read these, but I'll give them a quick run through here. We cut the following freshman field hockey coach, JV boys, JV girls coaches, JV volleyball coach, freshman girls basketball coach, freshman boys basketball coach, JV wrestling coach and freshman baseball and softball coaches, all of those have been eliminated. So those sports are laid out. Admittedly, sometimes the girls basketball, there's not a girls freshman team, um, but we have to budget because it's part of the agreement. This year, we're not allowed to have that. So the teaching positions that we got. So at Page, there was an art teacher. We cut point four art teachers, so we have a point six there now. Back okay, now, we've got a sixth grade teacher and a kindergarten teacher. You should keep these in mind. We, I'll show you uh, the elementary members, because that's another piece that I've heard about quite a bit. A sixth grade teacher and a kindergarten teacher. The middle school nurse, you had in your bags, we got the middle school nurse position. Um, high school, it got an English teacher, a math teacher. At the middle school, high school, a half time course teacher, and we got a full time art teacher. Um, also, at high school, we got a wellness teacher, a point two music teacher, that I know the library media aid got cut. Um, two paraeducators, just paraeducators to help out and uh, support, uh, support personnel, special education classes. Over at Suiza, we got a kindergarten teacher and a first grade teacher. And in middle school, uh, we got a science teacher. These are actual positions that we have last year. So when a person says to me, well, I know you guys are just trying to figure out how they work. Yeah, I I, I, I promise you, I, I, everyone here has heard me say before, even if you're starting, I have no interest in lying to anybody. That's just too much to remember. Charles Hartnett has it is. But I'm not going to go in a budget conversation and say, well, if you don't do this, and these are the teachers that are going to go, because you're one of those teachers, you don't want to do that. And that's definitely not a good approach to being supportive and respectful of the people that are working with you. Um, so those were the positions that actually we had last year that are not here this year. And then these were other positions that we said we needed, and there were not, it obviously weren't ever, it weren't cut, but it, the positions the request was cut. So three special education points, those were people we already have, had and still have them. It was just an extension so that they could take our administrative role and spend more time working in special education. Two special education teachers, we still hired four. <clears throat> we have to. Um, we'll get to those two in a second. Tech theater aid. So, great space this is. We just don't have anybody to run it. So, we have a uh, person who's on site and who works with Kentucky only for the site. Um, so, we have a performance coming out into the woods here. I think that's the first big performance. It'll be December 1st, 2nd, 7 p.m., and on Saturday the 3rd, it's 2 p.m. For that nation, and we're kind of trying to figure that out on our own, I believe. Is that right? Because we don't have anybody on this auditorium. So, this auditorium should be used by every community. All of our three towns 
the means you're using this. That's not going to happen because you don't have something to do with that. Um, we also have an uh, HR manager and a bagging out tech aid. Um, so those are all taken out. Does anybody have any questions so far? This is okay. All right. So how do we protect the classroom? So it seems like a ridiculous thing to say. How do we protect the classrooms if I just showed you? <clears throat> Those are the things we have to help. <clears throat> so for cloud years, they, you see the bottom half right there. Right? So they talked about the athletics. We moved the cap and doubled the user fees. That was expected to generate an additional 105000 plus before and after school. Those fees are raised $50 each, so that's supposed to increase about 100000 So if you combine those two numbers, you end up with that number, which does take you to about, we say, three and a half teaching positions by doing that. And again, the number I used last year, I believe, when I was with Towns, because we've gone through and done this, right? We've gone through, calculated this out, what are the possible ways we can salvage? And well, I went around, so we're going to be about 20, 21 positions, like I said, and we add all this up. That's what it comes out to be. That's how we did that. And this is just a fact. This is how I'm operating. And you'll see why in a second. But at this point, we protect elementary at all costs. So your elementary students, their classrooms, that's what gets protected. And that, at all costs, means middle school and high school is going to continue to take the hit. Why? Because when you hit seventh grade, you would have gone through those developmental and those founding stages where you're learning, learning the critical skills. And so if you end up in a class of 35, 40, that's what you end up in. Uh, I will also say this. We meet, obviously, the building project not because you walked in yourself selling. All the activity went on. But we, what was it, Monday? On Monday, when we confirmed that we were ordering additional $250,000 out of the capital building project, for more furniture. Because right now we have 26 seats in each classroom. We have to buy the furniture to prepare for 30 seats in each classroom. So all that on the backdrop, so all that not good stuff, we still had to add for special education teachers. And we're on the verge now of posting for two more special education positions. Now you all should be looking at me saying that is crazy. You just cut all those teachers. Why did you bring back the elementary people? Well, we want to. This, we are legally required to do. And if we don't, those students are going to go out of the district and will cost us upwards of $200,000 each. So it is a cost analysis, but I will tell you, we want students to get what they need, wherever that may be. That's our duty, that's our responsibility. So if a student has to, we can't do it here in school, they have to go up, they have to go up. But if we are able to provide a school, we're able to keep children in our district where their peers are, where they're going to be playing, where they're going to be interacting, where they're going to be hanging out with friends. And that's ultimately what you really need to do. So all that happens while all the positions are being cut. And this is not new. I think you may have, uh, I know I've showed the slides before, but this is something that's happened since I've been here in every single school district. And it's a problem. It is a problem that we're trying to address as superintendents with the state. It's a problem we've been talking to legislators about. Is this going to get solved soon? No, it's not going to get solved for fiscal year 24. It's going to take time to unravel. And hopefully, we were able to put something together that's palatable so that the state can look at it and say, okay, we can do this, but that'll be a starting point. So, our process. We heard something about this last year. Everything came in late. So, here is some Take this in, but the budget process. So October through December, internal budget process. Let me tell you what that means. That means we have to go around and think about, okay, what do we have? What are we looking like we need? Like I just said, we because of students we added this year, we have to add two more special education teachers. So things aren't static, things are very dynamic, some changes. Late November, later this month, the department chairs will go ahead and do presentations to the school committee about positions they might be thinking about. Just uh, I will get a, uh, what do we call that? CP preview for a uh, trailer. Not going to be a lot there. We'll see why in a little bit. Um, and then Mark 
second, which is, oh, sorry, the second of January, the budget gets presented to the school committee. March second. So if you are Angus, Carol, or Rebecca, this should not make you feel good because it doesn't make us feel good. There will be a new governor this year, and she or he has five weeks until after normal deadlines to put up their budget. We cannot give firm members in the budget until we have the governor's budget. So March second is the deadline for that. The reason why it's problematic. Anybody know the date of the May election this year? May 1st, the earliest you can possibly be, naturally. So you have a new governor, and you have May 1st, this is when the election's going to happen. So it takes, if you have your town first, they will tell you it takes about 45 days. You need 45 days to get the network to put it on the ballot. So if you rewind 45 days, you have on March 15th, where the towns have to decide. So that gives the towns, for March 2nd, when the governor comes out with his or her budget, to March 3rd, where Greg will have the treasurer give the numbers to the, our treasurer, the treasurer will certify those, send them to the towns, and the towns are like, okay, now we have to figure out what number do we want to put on the ballot if it's an override, or what are we going to put into our budget. That is just the reality of how this budget process works. And aside from that March date, this is the same process every year. Aside from the March date. That usually is the 4th January, 3rd January, the what, 3rd January? 4th, 3rd January, 4th January, good. I'd like to see that calendar. And then April, there's town meetings, and in May 1st, it's the election. Anybody have any questions on this? Okay, so the facilities. This is always a really interesting one. These slides are way small and now the middle school and high school has been uh, removed. Um, so bag now. So if you're enrolled, you're bag now. You can take a look here, but just wait for the asbestos alleviation. Thankfully, the uh, world has done a wonderful job of addressing this every single year. They put a big chunk of money into alleviating, so they go into certain classroom hallways, they do an abatement in that area, they put down new flooring, uh, and, 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 so that has been fabulous. 2012, 2013, there was the MSBA project. 13, 14, there was new wings added. And 14, there's wall pads that were added. So 2019, you see a few things there. I remember the roof part. Um, <clears throat> but there's playground renovation, the ramp for the rear door, and then the roof warranty. So the roof, that was actually fire stone paint and plumbing, and it was under warranty, so they were able to put a brand new roof on there, which is fabulous. And just recently, They've added the cafeteria tables, the carry fog, they put in the courtyard, and the trees, if you saw the pictures, you didn't see the pictures, really cool. Um, they had these big cranes coming in and taking the trees out of the middle courtyards. Um, because that's the only way to get to them out there very close. So that's what's happened with Bang Out in the past. The next five years, so this is a report that I've given to all of the town administrators they have and they'll share them with their boards. Um, so it goes over everything that we see over the next five years. We do this every year in October. We usually, we, 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 this, this is one of the first times we've done a look back. So it's one of the first times we've done a look back. But these are things that have to be remedied. Um, so the town has to decide which they can't do, which they can't do, and you know they would ask us, say, okay, what do you need to function? Um, we're able to give those answers. As you can see, this is a list of uh, things that need that are asbestos remediation can take care of, there's no oil tank there. The lead-free plumbing fixtures, not a long communication system, so I'm not gonna read it. But that's the list of the next five years of things that have to um, be taken care of. Or don't have to, but they're in the capital project. And the price tags on these vary from one to the um, from one project to the next. And of course the price tag today is going to be lower than it will be five years now. So Paige, you have the award-winning um, longest list of completed projects since 2011. Uh, yeah, that's a, I don't know, that's, you can read that. I'll put it online, it's a lot, a lot to read. But there's a lot of work that's been done to Paige. I mean, there's reason for it, right? So Paige is a really old building, it's three stories high. Um, and it's 100 years old, it's 100 years old. It's over 100 years old. That's 
to go to bed from place to place. And there's, it's not easy if you're trying to get into a single block or brick wall and read wires, it's not, that's not easy to do. The, um, uh, one of the things I know Bob Danforth, who's right here, and Greg Hatton will tell you is some of the more interesting pictures coming in when you're on the floors, and they have to take out a section of floors because it's, it's gypsum underneath. Gypsum creek, is that what we call that? So not the concrete that you walked in, but gypsum, which of course, take a guess. More expensive or less expensive than a regular concrete? That's right. That would be less expensive, which means it doesn't hold so well. So we're on the second floor and there's slight wobbles. It's because of the uh, least okay. So that's pages list of what's been done. So Western region has been all over that, um, taking care of that fire alarm system. I know the playground. Two huge recent projects, very big projects. And the next five years, um, this may look like a short list, but this is um, so things that they'll have that other schools do not. We use concrete lentils. So, I know. That's true to say lentil. That's a spelling error. Lentil is a bean. Lentil is a. Yeah. Um, I'll get that correction before we get that close. Concrete lentil beans. Think about that. So, so concrete lentils. Those are just the, the facades over there. There's some nice artwork that's kind of uh, etched into them. Um, and then there's the layers going all the way around. And over time, the board that pulls them in to break the parcel, those pieces fall down periodically or chip away, or it allows water seep in. And we all know what happens when you get water going into your house, and no one knows about it over a period of time, not good things. So there's, there's quite a bit here uh, for them to look okay. into. So streets are not here. Now, I know this looks big, but I have to increase, I can increase the pond here. But a lot of work has been done here as well. Uh, again, like Bagnell, they've been assessing re remediation for different years. They also are part of the MCA program. Um, a lot of parking lights, parking <coughs> hallways, a lot of lights. The boiler system operator is the biggest one that's coming there right now. Um, and the entrance awning. Is that entrance awning? Does that happen? Yes, sir. It, it is done. Okay. That's at the suite, so that entrance awning. Because if, you, if you're a parent of suite, sir, you go to the front, you go to the front office. And in the winter time, it's wonderful. Right? It's very nice, it looks pretty. And then the house, and when you come the next day, because it was freezing the next day, there's these big long icicles hanging down, which you have to actually tell you to go around this way because you don't want to go underneath the icicles. So the next five years, this is what's on their chart. Um, a lot of similar things, a lot of specialist mediation, the lead free 911, kitchen equipment. Um, as we serve, there's a playground, the design of the playground structure, the boiler, and boiler room upgrading. I can't believe our own that is a um, Fire alarm system stayed off for it. So that's what's on the air list basically. Overall, I'm going to go to the next slide first. So middle high school, very short list. Everything we need to deal with now is on punch list, and that is a tedious, tedious task. That Bob, Greg, Jonathan, myself, um, Terry, Lisa, like, oh, and all the teachers, anyone who's in here, they add on to this list and we bring out these items. Um, but everything is phase one is done. That's the building. That's where we are right now. Phase two is everything that's happening out front. That should be done by the end of this month, starting next month. And then phase three is the uh, where the junior high was. That's going to be the competition stadium for soccer, lacrosse, football. And then you have up in front as well, it'll be field hockey, baseball, softball, and well, it's really a multi purpose field. Because those fields are all going to be designed for uh, all youth sports as well, to be able to go out and use. Um, so that's going to be the end of 20, 2023, not 2022. So there's, but all, all we need to do at that point is we're working with all the vendors to help make sure that we've identified everything so the replacements, the inspections, all that gets done in the correct way in the time of the process. So as a whole, when you look at how, how are the facilities, the facilities are a big chunk of money. Well, there's work to be done, that's for sure. If, if someone comes and asks me, I know uh, uh, Rick Parker's asked me before, like, uh, how do you feel about page? Well, okay, page is great. Can we learn the page? Yes, we can. Is it fun for teachers and students to walk three flights of stairs up and down? No, not, not really. But is it horrible? Yes. Um, are there issues that have to be addressed? Yes. Um, and that's the same for each town. And that's why that capital projects plan is there. That's just kind of a guide for towns. But I do think it's one 
one thing that's important when you do when you do get into it. I mean, your budgets are what they are. You can only address what you can address, but it's you know uh, we try to put in you know, we try to spread enough so it's not all of it wants to be. Here's the most critical things. Any questions? Yeah. So. So if we follow the plan, are we thinking that the elementary schools will last another 10 years, 15 years? What is the time horizon until we might need a new elementary school? So we might need it. Uh, so I, I think the, um, what would you, I think if, you, if, if we keep up with the maintenance, if we keep up with the maintenance, so the custodians are doing their part, the facilities are taking care of the filters, checking on the HVAC, the water plumbing, uh, I think we'd be in good shape for numerous things. I don't think there's, it's just that it'll come to the point where, as I recall, Donahue, the issue of windows, right? that's one of the biggest expenses, the windows of Donahue that need replacing. And the hope is you go in there and those windows get replaced, it's not a big deal, you just put in new windows. And the fear, of course, is you go to replace those windows and there's another structure thing. But that aside, as long as it's up and running, those would be in good shape. Uh, back now, we kind of do the same thing. Like there's, there's all these pieces. Um, as long as you kept up, we should be in good shape. These tests have been big sample issues, and then like absolutely. So I think that that's why we should age is just tough. Age is tough. I think it's, it's certainly doable, but it's a much older building, and I'm not sure how to. And yet we, we fair to say that is where the overwhelming majority of our money goes is to pay for facilities now. Yeah, so you, go ahead. Um, so what is the impact of the budget challenges on our ability to follow the statements plan and keep everything up to the standard that we would hope to be able to do? Yeah, so, so that ends up being up to each town. Each town has to make that decision. And, uh, and I think when I look at some of those numbers when they come on in the years, um, some projects are huge, just really big. I think there's a couple of $250,000 project, there's a half a million. So if we don't do it, if the project doesn't get done, okay, you can, you can move it down. Uh, sooner or later, though, uh, to Chris, your point, that project either gets done or it doesn't create more problem. Um, it's like a caveat, right? You can address it now or keep on getting worse, and sooner or later you can kind of pull it out. Uh, or you can get it filled, take care of The problem is it might not be a failure. You might not have the money in order to fund it. Of where it is, so um, and that's that each town needs to make that decision. But I think if there were a situation where you were asked or had to do something um, and, and saw that plan, and you said, I oh, can't do that, we would come to you and say, If you don't do that, we, we can't be in there. And that is certainly a possibility. We would, I mean, we would never let it get to that point. I don't really want to get to that point. Nobody wants to. No, nobody wants to. I'm just trying to get 
the time. Oh, sure, sure. fair enough. So I think at that point, you, you, you DPW, then DPW, working with our facilities director, Bob Dampel, which is a great place to get that nuts and bolts. And then at ADA information, getting it from your DPW is probably the best way for the board to go. We don't have DPW. <laughs> Who's there not that? Highway Highway Park, sorry. Yeah, we have a very small town, but the second question I have is, um, and I know it's in the original agreement that said that you are the investor report at the end of the year that tells us what makes and didn't you've done on our school buildings. And I don't think I've ever seen that report. What's it again? This is, I thought you were supposed to give us a report at the end of the fiscal year about the maintenance that you've done on our school building if you've done any at all. Well, it's just in the regional agreement that you're supposed to get a report. So I guess, I'm just, you know, sometimes we get, like, confused as to who's putting things in the path of them. Are we putting them in? Are you putting them in? How's that happening? And when we see, you know, areas of the school where there needs to be some small maintenance, are you going to do that maintenance? Are you going to wait until it gets to the point where the cross is over? I'm just kind of, like, if we knew what was going to be done, then that would be helpful. Yeah, I think anything that we can't handle my understanding is, well, always goes worse with all the, all the towns. So it's the highway department, if it's DW or West Newbury, or Boston, or all the Merrimack, he works with them to find out what's going on or tells them. Oilers was a big thing. That was us telling Merrimack, hey, well, this isn't going to last. We can't, we can't, we will keep it running as long as we can, but we can't replace the boilers. That's, that's out of the $10,000 show. So, and the same thing with black feet and smaller materials. Um, I, I, I can't think of any diagnosed specific examples. Circulator pumps, that doesn't mean anything to me. Circulator pumps come to circulate hot water for the county. Okay, yeah, hot water. So, so, but I know that's the key report, so the, the reason we it does talk about capital projects, what's been done in the past, what's that moving forward, and I think they, 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 they keep track of everything. Yeah, they, they keep track of everything. I think it's just a school do the report, you can probably print out for a school. So, is there a report or not for not for you? Just like a run list. Basically, it's with uh, between the DBW or the uh, or whoever oh. was there. We talked to it and told them what we were doing. And uh, oh. our normal maintenance is always on the top priority. Filters, cleaning. All that stuff is all done by us and every year too. So, so, so you're, you're, you're not interested in the filter change schedule. You're saying if there was like, if you recognize something on the water, like there's a broken faucet or something like that. Right, I just want to make sure that, you know, we're working together on things that are getting replaced. If we're replacing something, we don't want you to change anything else on it. But just make sure there's communication. Yeah, that. Sure. that was probably the intent of that section of the regional agreement. Immediately, I contacted my representatives, 
who are our representatives, so it's Nani Mira, Senator Tarr, and Senator Zogby. I just got this, I don't know where you stood on this, but this is a problem for us. It's a problem for us, it's going to be a problem for a whole lot of people. Um, and I've talked about this in the past, but it's a disproportionately disadvantaged situation for a Pawtucket. Yeah, they raise things somewhere two to four percent each year. I thought there was an adjustment pretty recently that was bigger than the regular. Not yeah, so they have that they always do each year it goes up. And, and we don't there's no sense. It's not like it's a vote where all the towns so municipalities are supposed to say, yep, that's where we go with that. It's just a group of legislators say, yep, that's what they want. Well, because they if they don't get that 14 percent, they can't hire the people they need, they're not able to provide the care that they need because it's all based on inflation. So, that applies to all the tuition rates in fiscal year 24, that 14% increase. Ironically, we are part of two collaboratives. It's the Crest Collaborative and the North Shore Education Collaborative, and they do not get these 14% increases. All they get are whatever the districts can afford to give them. So they usually go after a two and a half to four and a half percent increase, the same way, so we, this is, is we want to collaborate. with. It's like we're now the municipality in that collaborative regional school district. But that 14% increase for Pentucket, for the students we have right now, that's $546,000, or 1.14% of our current budget. So that's what that number is. And there is nothing we can do about it. We will be meeting with our legislators, talking to them, asking where they fall on this, why they did not stop, why was this allowed, and they'll go ahead and give us answers. And we can put pressure on them, that's great. But this just, this just happened. There's not much we can do about it. Anybody have any questions on this? Because this is a huge, huge number. I have a question, Mr. Palmer. So just rough numbers, our budget right now for the Kentucky Regional School District is about 48 million. So if we just did two and a half percent increase to say we do two and a half percent of work allowed, that's a million dollars. That's half of it. Before we've done anything else. Roughly accurate, yeah. So so everyone is aware of what we're facing already. We haven't done anything and it's already half our allowed budget time. We are 34 percent. I can't tell you that right now because, great, so just a great point. Um, when we add those two special education teachers, they're not permanent yet. So that they, those are still needed. We add those in the budget. That changes number. So yeah, that 546 is just for this. Um, but that you would suspect will drive us up closer to 35 percent, 36 percent. Question in our area is not. That we are the highest, but not by staggering amounts. So the question is, um, girls are responsible for about 39% of that number. You know, we put the line share in the budget. Okay, so even without you replacing staff or holding on staff or keeping up with costs, we're already looking at $200,000 increase in our assessment. And then, you know, and then forward. So a 1.1% increase on your on a $48 million budget. Think of that.
I mean, this is a big number. Also, very important side, this is a seasonal side, this is not a, an us versus them situation. Yes, it, it always appears that way. We're coming to you saying, hey, here's the money that we need. That, here's the money that we need because that, that's what we know as educational, as experts in our field. This is what we all need in order to get school to run the way we want it to run, or the way we think our school committee expects us to run our school district. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. All right, just one more clarifying question. Sure. We are. Sorry, just a clarifying question. We are mandated by the state to fund us. That is, is that correct? correct? Yes. yes. We have no choice. Right. So the answer on that is yes, and we have no choice on that, and there are a little season more things where we have to do things we have to do. Oh, yes, um, thanks. Is the circuit breaker taking on any of this? So, circuit breaker uh, on OST is the tuition. There's a whole bunch of things that's in the work. So, circuit breaker goes down now. 75% of the maximum reimbursement that a state will give, but only after you pay the foundational amount, which I believe is about 69000 How much? 49000 So, we have to pay 49000 And then anything over 49000 the state, you should be using circuit breaker to pay 75% of what's left. And we cover 25%. What's not included in that is. Transportation, the transportation getting there back, which, as I recall, is somewhere near. Oh, oh, sorry, we'll get to that in a second. I, I know what you're saying, but I haven't seen the dollars yet, so I don't believe it. So, a little fun fact on circuit breaker in the last 10 or 15 years, it's only been fully funded twice. And that will be a theme that we hear quite a bit. Um, so, yes, if, if, if the student goes somewhere at $546,000, um, it is going to be subject to. Uh, circuit breaker, but we just don't know what circuit breaker is going to be because we don't get last year's numbers. We're not going to get until the following year. Funding formula. So a lot of conversations, a lot of security conversations, a lot of funding formula. I think I said this before. We can argue, debate, whatever it is. I'm not going to disagree. I don't like the formula. Nobody likes the formula. It's not going to change this year. If you don't like the formula, I believe, uh, Anthony, you guys tried to study this formula and work with the legislature trying to get things done, and you get nowhere. Uh, we've made phone calls asking them about, hey, we called, we called directly to uh, some money they cut from us. We called and asked them to explain it. And so you just had uh, fewer students than me. So, okay, well, we lost 60% of that money. Like, how is that possible? That's just the way you came. Great, thank you. That's very insightful. So that's what we have to do. We don't control that. And until someone in the legislation sets up for us, um, it's just going to be a waste. By the way, another thing I need to tell you all this is important. I was at a recent meeting, um, a subcommittee meeting that I'm working on, that I'm working in, and um, the executive member who works with the state legislators said that they view all the superintendents now. I was just being whining about money. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We're not whining about money. We're trying to put out facts and show why this is happening. And, and we'll get to a couple of this information. But this is going to apply to everyone in the Northeast. No oh, idea what this is going to be. Heating and electric costs. We hear numbers, we hear crazy stories, we see big numbers, um, but we don't know what it's actually going to play out to be. But that has an impact on everyone. I don't know how Greg's going to put in the number for the fiscal year 24 to figure out what that number is going to be. If you're here, then you're here. What do you predict for the next year? So, this is something that, oh, this is a challenge. So, this is our challenge set. So, we have employee shortages, uh, particularly para educators. I think we're down more than a dozen. Um, and those are just positions that are hard, really hard to fill. And they're hard to fill. Um, and they're one of the positions we need the most because they go into classrooms, they help out, they support the special education teachers, they work with students who are, uh, have um, specific needs. And when those paraeducators aren't there, we struggle with providing services. And we don't have substitutes, so we're going to sell the paraeducators for the subs as well. Um, and that creates a, a challenge. Custodians have been tough to come by, as have special education teachers. Um, so those areas are particularly challenging for us, and we don't have a system in place 
I got, we, we have in our district zero interns from the college university. All the districts I was in, we have dozens and dozens. So you'd be able to use that, but we don't have a mechanism or a person in place to be able to help us get that system set up um, because it's, we have what we have. Um, so I've talked about this enough, and I just want to be super, super, super clear. I wasn't clear the first time. Students need what they need in order to be successful. This is not a, hey, it's the student's fault or it's the family's fault. Uh -huh. If we can't provide the service if we don't have the ability to, they should be where they can get the service. That should not be up for debate. What is up for debate is why in the world the school district is responsible for some aspects of special education when the student is, for example, receiving medical care. When you need medical care, who pays that bill? Your insurance. But that's not the way it works in Massachusetts for some unknown reason. It's super odd. It's very uh, incorrect. The best answer I got from the uh, Senator Lewis was that if they increase those expenses passed on to medical insurance, it would increase the cost of our benefits. To which I said, okay, that's fine. Increase it, spread it out amongst millions of people instead of having to put it on small municipalities. Transportation. So last year the issue with transportation was cost. That contract is done. Right now it's availability and reimbursement. Remember, regional, when you regionalize, as part of the regional agreement, the regionalization benefits are that you're supposed to get 100% of regional transportation reimbursed. That's not happened. Usually we have strong support for that. Um, it didn't happen. And when we're talking about when we're talking specific right now, also I want you to just remember, out in the western part of the state, there's regional districts all over the place. And they travel a lot further than we do. So when they're not getting that reimbursement, that is crushing them. So when we're going over all these problems about Pawtucket, this applies to a lot of the small municipalities. And we basically are somewhat fed up with every all this that's happening. It's just we don't have numbers. We don't have legislators, legislative numbers to push these through and make things happen. And then the availability. So we've had to cancel buses on a Friday night for a Saturday morning event. It's tough to go on field trips. It's just it's challenging to get buses now. Student Opportunity Act, I'm just giving you a heads up on this. You're going to read about this. This is the billions and billions of dollars that will be injected into public education over the next six years. Um, that is true, but uh, in Tucket, that's going to be $65,000. It's not going to be some of our neighbors that are receiving over a million dollars each year. We are not getting that. That's not coming to Tucket. $65,000 is what's coming to Tucket. So I'm not going to get into the whole piece of how that doesn't even help some of our neighbors with a million dollars because it's not really a million dollars that gets added to their education budget. It's really probably only 100000 because that municipality takes the other 900000 And if you're a legislator, all you've successfully done is go out to your town or city and make a $900,000 for them to play with. Versus someplace like the Tiger, you get $65,000 and that's what we get. So what does it really mean? It really means that maybe we can salvage a teacher out of the Student Opportunity Act. Until that might want to sell and just the funny So, uh, Patty had talked about this with school nurses. So the Department of Public Health uh, sent me an interesting letter to the chair as well and said, hey, your middle school high school is not within the 1 to 500 ratio that we recommend for schools. And as a result of that, we are not allowing you to do medication delegation. So first, medication delegation means as a teacher, the nurse can teach me how to give you medicine. So when we go on a field trip, I take the medicine, and when it comes time for me to give you medicine, I can give you that medicine. For some reason, that no longer is capable of happening. We're not allowed to do that. Um, I, they could not get to the logic of this, but what was interesting was they, <laughs> when I talked to them, I said, you know, we had to cut this position. They said, yeah, you cut this position because you moved into one school instead of having two or you decided to just put one. I said, you know, there's more to the story than that. Said, you cut it down. I said, we cut it down to one because it was between, say this now, it was between that 
nurse, or a sixth grade teacher, or a dummy. So it was either this nurse, or it was going to be at sixth grade, we were going to have classes in the low 30s. That's what the zip was. And that, I thought, oh, we didn't know that, we weren't sure. So I'm still waiting now that they're going to take that back into consideration. But that means every time someone goes on a field trip now, if they don't have a nurse, that field trip cannot happen. So nurses are required for those field trips. Now, I wasn't too worried about it. We were expecting that was probably going to happen in the middle high school. But the middle high school students are old enough where a lot of medication may take. It is long duration, so they don't have to take it before school. They don't have to worry about it afterwards. There's certain exceptions to that, but elementary is way different. So this is uh, a problem for us. So this, this is kind of a message I sent out. I don't have numbers. We want to have numbers of how much they're pulling back until the government budget comes out. But this is just the way it is. Um, they're pulling back, and then we need to fill the gaps. So when that happens, and at the same time, grant money disappears, and asset disappears. Uh, how, how do we fill that? Now, Greg will tell you, we do not allow ourselves to go ahead and fund positions <clears throat> while I'm asking positions with SMI. Do we have positions with SMI right now? We absolutely do. The hope is that in time, there will be an opportunity to move those people into a regular position instead of SMI position. Um, but when that money's done, how do we fill those gaps? So when we think back to where we started with the academics, how do you, how do you expect to maintain that level, the competitive level, level or provide whatever classes and services those students need when all that money is done. State auditor's report. You should look that up. You should look particularly at the part about transportation. So the state auditor's report is really good. It's a good document whole. But they talk about how all the transportation factors, like the state has defaulted, has not been funding in that remember. We are in a surplus year where the state took over more than $3.4 billion over what they were expected. And our regional transportation is not fully funded. I, I don't know how to, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, this is the part where you try to not get angry. This is the part where I do get angry inside and I smile on the outside. I say, okay, we'll just fix that. We'll deal with it. We'll try to figure it out. State Auditor's Report goes right into that. That's out of uh, Bob's office. The Rural Schools Division Report, look at that one. Look at the section on special education, how they say they're getting decimated because they're bedroom communities. And state auditor's report mentions this, because they're bedroom communities and they don't have industry to get them the money they need and other places do. Does that sound familiar? It's talking about it's the only reason we're not considered a rural district is because we have too many people per square mile. But aside from that, we're very much like the rural, rural school district. But those two reports are very condemning of the way the state has been working and funding. So another little fun piece of information. <clears throat> so the inflation factor that's used in budgets, uh, Jesse confirmed this, 9.1%. <clears throat> so inflation is done about 9.1% is what we confirmed. State legislators have a cap of 4.5%, so if you can do the math, that's the difference of 4.6%. So just think about it. What are the things in a budget? So a budget is consumed primarily by the boss. What's the number one thing that consumes a budget? Payroll. Payroll. So fortunately, payroll, we know what that's going to be. That's predictable for us. But everything else, 9.1%. And they're only going to get 4.5%. Bus. Bus. Are they going to give the target 4.6%? No. They're going to follow Chapter 7 formula. And if those of you who remember, how much will we be getting per student because we're held harmless? Anybody remember that number? $30 per suit is what we will be getting. It will be health promise That's just a really good guess. We'll get $30 a suit, so if you multiply 30,000, $30 times 2,200 suits, you wind up with $66,000 is what we'll get. So that inflation factor, not good for us. The legislative cap, not good for us. If you're in a different, much larger district, sure, that might be a huge help for you, but it's not going to help us here because we are health harmless. 
In addition to that, the benefits at 5.16%, that's projected increase. We don't know that. That number comes out in March or February, March. That number comes out. There's no cap on that, but that's what they're projecting. So those are just some really significant numbers um, that are coming in. So our students and teacher ratios, so I have to go over here, because this was kind of a big point. So hopefully you can see. I'm gonna stand back here. So what you see on this chart is the school on the left, the grade, the number of students that are enrolled, the number of teachers that exist. So we have to spell a few minutes that come up. And the average class size. And this is target size. Let me explain the target size. If you're a kindergarten teacher, and it just happens to know we have a uh, second grade teacher for you. First grade teacher, sorry. First grade teacher with us. If you have 18 students, okay, that's the target. That's where we want to be. Why? Is it a big difference if you go to 20? So it's not like I had 18 kids in my biology class and I added two more. Different story altogether. Different story when they're in ninth, tenth grade. When they're in kindergarten, first and second grade, they require far more attention. So that's the targets. So when you look at the number of students, the number of teachers, you can see an average class size. So when you look at sweets on the far right, that tells you how over we are at or above. The sweets are in the top shape. You recall, we got two teachers from Suiza. What teachers do we have? Kindergarten and first grade. So as a result, right now we have 23 kids per kindergarten class and 22 students per first grade class. That is not good. But that's what we got. Donahue is in pretty good shape. So Donahue is in good shape. It's by the page. Not surprising to you when you see kindergarten numbers are high. So Paige is over as well. They got 21 one class and 20 in the other. And that goes to both first grade and second grade. So just you can see right here that there's three teachers each grade level at Merrimack. When you go to Paige, there's two teachers, except there's one of three. So if we would get email messages saying, hey, but it's not fair. You're cutting teachers, you're talking about cutting teachers at Bagnell or, or Merrimack, you need to cut the page, they get everything. Well, if you cut a teacher from page, they're gonna have 41 teach kids in class. No. 41 kids in class together have that. So I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know, I wouldn't begin to tell you how to ask how to teach that. Now sure, you could in third grade, but well, I said we drop that down, you have 29 to 28 in that class. So again, it's all about what do we want for our students, but those are the numbers of page. These are real, actual numbers. And there's that now. So three at every grade level, except for sixth grade, which is two, and four at first. And you can see, like the other schools, kindergarten is over. And sixth grade is in tough shape, and second grade is in tough shape. Those are the numbers. So if your three kindergartens are over, the way we are set up, in order to balance that, next year you have to add three first grade teachers. <clears throat> I don't see us doing that. I don't see how that could be, how it could be possible. Um, you have so many other deficits. I mean, it would be probably one of the first areas we would look at. We look at kindergarten, what comes in, but those are big, big numbers. So what do we expect from that? So what I said earlier on, do I expect this to keep going up? Yes, two other points. <laughs> right now, we have big classes in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. That means students are not getting as much attention as they normally would. And so they're not getting, they might be the deficits, might be out, so they won't be advancing as further as they could. So each year, that's going to grow and grow. And again, I'm not making this up. This is literally my field of expertise. This is what I've spent many years um, doing and studying. So that is how this plays out. Uh, or as Dr. Jarvis says, we've seen this movie before. That's how this goes. So when we look at these, another misconception is that, hey, this isn't fair. 
I went on and got to see the report card, and I saw the students are having way more, a way more student to teacher ratio than back now. You need to fix Okay, let's go back to that. So that's a good point. That is true. That is a true statement. Sweetser, and Donna, you do have, particularly Sweetser, has a way lower student to teacher ratio. One thing about that is that those people are adults. They're not teachers. They're paraeducators. They do not count the same as a teacher, They're not a certified teacher. So you cannot count a paraeducator. A paraeducator is not going to class. I can't assign class to a paraeducator to one. They've not been educated, they've not been licensed, they don't have, they don't have the certification. Additionally, Sweetser happens to be the first location where a lot of our special needs programs existed. And if you have a special needs program going on, you might have three kids and two adults in that space, a teacher and a parent. So when you have that, sure, all of a sudden the ratio is look amazing. But there's a reason for it. These are the actual classroom teacher numbers along with the student numbers. And so when you have programs, as Sweetser has many programs, and recently they've been adding them to page and uh, back now programs have expanded, which is what we want, those numbers start to look smaller. If you just look at the number of adults, even if you took the certified number of teachers, because those teachers who are at Sweetser, those special education students, are licensed in special education. So when you see those ratios, they're not gonna, those teachers aren't going to go and teach kindergarten, first grade, second grade. They're going to be working on the special education part of that grade. And so one more piece that I wanted to point out here. So I, I updated this recently. This is state uses October 1st as our uh, timeline for when they use numbers for students October 1st this year. There were zero, zero students in school because it was a Saturday. So you gotta go to October 3rd. But what you're gonna see here is that if you look down at ninth grade, there's 129 students. By far the lowest grade. We actually expected that number to be closer to 115 based on how many students typically leave to go to private school or a go tech school. That did not happen. Yes, there were students who left, we had more students came in. So we're at 129, which is not less. I think there were 135 last year in eighth grade. So not a big drop there like we were expecting. But if you look at kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, I, these are just Groveland, West Newbury, and Merrimack children. In the past, when we've had grades of that size, such as, well, not that size, but when you look at 11th, 12th grade areas, that are less. Choices are uh, just 12. So 12th grade is the last year of choices. So we did not, as far as I know, we never had class sizes that big ever. We did, when we did, they were because it had to be a school choice, there were choice students involved. So these are more students from World West Virginia Merrimack than we've ever had. And I would expect that the drop off, we would look at this and say, okay, eighth grade is 186. Students are going to go off, and we, Jonathan's not here, where is Jonathan? How, we lose about 20 to 30 students. Uh, maybe 15 to 16 percent. 15 to 16 percent loss, which is not what we experienced this year. So what we're going to see again next year is that 186 is going to drop or is it going to increase? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I see. Is it going to drop by that 15 percent or is it only going to drop by 5 percent like it did this year? So it's a tough, I mean, the bottom line on this one is, we went through all of our years of drops, 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 and each year, in order to make the budgets work, we were not filling. So a teacher would retire, we would let that position go. That position would be gone. We, that, we're not going to We're no longer able to do that. But again, I'm going to go back to protecting the elementary at the cost of the middle and high. That, that is what happened. So that's been brought up a few times tonight about the middle school and high school taking a hit, correct? And we were invited very graciously by our principals, some school committee members, to take boards recently at the schools. And um, I believe there are CP and honors classes being missed at certain levels because we don't have the staff at the middle high school. These middle high school kids, if I'm not mistaken, at the beginning of this presentation are also the kids that didn't benefit in the grade school level from 
a curriculum, a small curriculum year to year. So they took the hit in the younger years, pre-2017 when we were at 43%, and now we're asking them to take the hit in the middle and high school years. And to the Cloutier's point, Mr. and Mrs. Cloutier's point, we raised student fees, but even more dramatically, we, we lost teams. Kids can't participate if they want to, because we don't have the teams to provide them. We, we saw our percussion students drumming for their to raise funds, I give them so much credit for doing that, and, and the arts took a hit. We saw the art teacher and the choir teacher, so when we say middle school or high school will take the hit, I think they're already taking a lot of it. So, we're going to get more. Yeah. Okay. So, so, multiple things. One, yes. Uh, mainly because if you look at the elementary, there's nowhere else to go. If you take anything from elementary, it's a teacher that was class size is just balloon. <clears throat> and two, well, there's another point you made on that. Oh, well, about the athletic fees. So, uh, also with those athletic fees, we also have reduced athletic participation. And, and that absolutely could be a function of, all right, well, I can't afford it. Now, it's important. We all need to know. We still have a waiver process. If someone can't afford it, they can apply for a waiver. They do that through the business office. They go up and ask for information. They get information, and they'll adjust to make a do it, but like the Cloutiers, I don't have three, I only have two, but they wiped us out really quick with just a fall, and now it's going to happen again in the winter, it's going to happen again in the, in the spring. And like you, know, I think you all said, uh, for us, I think it's like a $2,200 increase. 2800 right? Yeah, we get the three, there you go. Yeah, that was, it's, it is, it's tough. It's tough.
I absolutely encourage you to share this out with folks. Um, if you have questions about any of this or anything else, I highly encourage you to reach out directly to the district, uh, Dr. Beam's team. They will get you a very straightforward, factual answer about whatever it is you want to know. Of course, you can also always individually reach out uh, to school committee members as well. Um, uh, I think we're generally pretty available to each other just one-on-one, -on -one, especially for the community, and if you don't have an answer, we'll do the same thing. Okay. I just told you all to do is just reach out to Dr. Beam's team. Sure, so like Kathy asked me that question right now. I look kind of silly because I just don't know. So I look at Bob, and Bob would be the one I sent that email to. We actually, coming up soon, have our cat, our director of tech here. Where is the other cat? Cat has helped set up. We're going to have, uh, it'll be up on the website soon. If people have questions, particularly as we're going through this, there'll be an email address that you just write that email address. And that'll go, it'll, it'll be reviewed and get sent to the person who's best equipped to answer that question. So if you ask a money question, that's going to go to right. If you ask a, is there such thing as a superintendent question, I will answer that. Whatever that is, I mean, um, I, we're going to have that out there on the website. So I think it's going to be something that's going to be, it's questions, a question that here is about work. But it'll be up on the website and that'll be promoted. So if people have questions, that can come in and we can review them. Um, just to make sure people have uh, accurate and correct information. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Justin, I don't know if I have a mic, so I'll just speak loud. Um, will this presentation be on the, the district website? Will the presentation be on the district website? Yes, as soon as I change lentils to lintel, <laughs> I'll make sure that it goes on the website. And also, July 2023. I'll change it to July 2023, otherwise, the field will be playing on it. Yes, absolutely. And actually, I think we, there's a, we have Guilfoyle PR is going to be putting together just an entire website when it just comes to budget topics. So just about here, here's the process, here's the timeline, here's the things that are coming up, and presentations like this might be up there. But just a, they're trying to make it so it's cleaner because what we experienced last year was put an FAQ thing, you put the FAQ, you put the answers in there, but you don't necessarily know who's looking at it or if people are even uh, paying attention. It wasn't super interactive either. So just moving forward again. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I'm sure, or I expect that Wes Newbury will probably um, put a link on our website, and um, I'm assuming we're hoping that uh, Groveland and Merrimack will do the same. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's valuable and compelling information, and, and the more people see it, the more people hopefully will get on board. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, that it, it, the more it gets out there, the better. I know. Um, so, Lana talked earlier about communication subcommittee, and I know Kat and I have talked about how we can make sure that people sign up. So, if they don't have children in the district, if they um, are just community members, or if they were alumni to move back, just to keep people informed about what's going on, um, like that's all to be. We had a good spirited conversation about that. Um, so it sounds like we're making headway on communication. I think that would be a song part as well. Like the school community member working or going to the, the um, some board of select meetings, just being present and having that. I think that would be a tremendous help. Um, I know with the past, you all used to see the edge meetings sitting there on Mondays or Tuesdays, once a month trying to get there. And since COVID, I've not been able to get back on that schedule because we have meetings. Sometimes the meeting schedules change. Tuesdays end up being a disastrous uh, meeting day. So, moving forward together. <clears throat> so, just said this website is dedicated just to budget that will be coming out soon. Um, so, so, this is, I mean, you try to think about how to frame this. We didn't create this problem. Right? This, it's, it's almost like you don't want, we, with information, you want to throw out information, you don't want to receive information. And what's happening to us budgetarily all these complexities, we end up having to react. And we're trying to be proactive. I know Chris Manning, you put together meetings with different representatives. Like a lot of people attended those meetings just to talk and say, hey, these are some of the problems that we're facing. So being proactive, and that's great. And we always end up being re reacting to it. So that 14% OSD, we didn't make that. That just got forced on us. The cost of special education, by the way, is the 766 is the 50th anniversary, right? I believe it's the 50th anniversary. So there's a lot of talk about, okay, we look at um, 50 years ago when the special education bill uh, law passed, 
and then you go to Education Reform Act of 1993. Nothing's happened in special education for the last 29 years in terms of funding. Like it's still the same model, a 30 year old model. That, that can't be good when you look at what it was like back in 93 to where it is now. So those are things that have to be addressed. Um, if there are questions, I think uh, Chairman Martin said this, if questions, we'll get to the actual answers. We'll use our expertise. So I say about Mr. Conway, said, this is literally what we do. This is what we spend all our time doing. Education, not all of our time, but most of our time. Education, this is what we spend like. And when it comes to money and finance, and the right wreck, everyone's favorite business manager is incredibly helpful. Just knows inside out. He's been on the municipality side and also knows it's and on the state side, and understands how the budgets work. So we will give you factual information. I don't like the information I get sometimes, particularly when it's coming from the state. And some of the responses, people aren't going to like. But I'm just going to go back to the one thing. The reason why we've been able to improve so much is because we created a culture where people are respectful and supportive of each other. And so if we can form that same we might not all be happy about the outcome, but at least we can do it in a positive way and get it done in be good role models for our students. So, on the fourth bullet point, where it says, you know, the state has to, yep. that's something that I feel like we heard a lot after the fail or around the failed override was, oh, look, we just vote, vote the override down, the state's going to have to deal with it. Like, they're going to make a change. And we see what situation that's put our kids in, right? We're choosing between 40, 30 kids in a second grade classroom or continuing to put our middle school and high school kids at a disadvantage going into their next phase of life. So I think that it just needs to be clear that continuing to like try to fix the problem that way is not a success. We need to be communicating with our representatives the way you guys are, the way so many of our board members are, and reaching out to the other people at the state level who can start to make those changes. Because even though it's not going to happen for next year, continuing to say, oh, well, they'll fix it if we make our situation bad enough is, it's not okay for our kids. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. Like, it, it is just like, it, how bad do you let things say You asked about the building earlier. Like, how long will the building last? Okay, well, how long can we keep this going? How long can we keep this up with, with toothpicks? And we'll see. I, I would say, Mr. Conway and Mr. Brett, you've got people who are pretty savvy that can try to make things work. And I think, I hope you all know, you get everything I got. Anything I got in the tank is what I'll give. This is the place to take care of me, I'll take care of it. Um, but it, how, how long can we do that? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so just when it comes to school, we will only provide factual information. Uh, nothing irritates me more than someone giving a political opinion, because I don't care. I don't care what their political opinions are. I care about the children. I care about what's best for them, how can we make it a better experience for them, and how can we make sure they have the greatest opportunity to be successful in their lives. Because ultimately, they're going to be taking care of me, and I don't want people who aren't good at something taking care of me. And no more should you want that for you. So providing the best for our kids so they can come back and take care of our community is a really key thing. If we do a, a shoddy job of it, then we reap what you sell. If we do a great job of it, then we reap what we sell. And this is, not, this is not a, hey, we need millions and millions of dollars uh, of stump speech here. It's just, it's the reality. It's just the reality. Um, one other thing, and this is, the, about keeping the April town meeting dates, and those came up, there was a shift um, in some of the dates in two of the towns. So, so I just, I don't think anyone would have understood how that impacts us. We have to notify employees at a certain date whether or not they're returning. Two years ago, during COVID, we had to notify a whole school of paraeducators that they were not returning because the state, we didn't know where things were, it was in limbo, and so we sent those letters out. And we lost, I think it was about 15 paras. And then the state came out and said, oh yeah, we got the money, don't worry about it. Because, oh, so then we're going back, trying to backtrack, but those paras went out and we got jobs somewhere else. So if we don't hit those main deadlines with our notifications of assignment and non-renewals or reduction of force, we are violating the agreement, that's not good. We have to hit those dates. So it means it held afterwards to approve a budget or not approve a budget, whatever it is, it puts us in a really bad position and makes a bad problem potentially so much worse because we're going to be sending letters to teachers who want to keep, 
that you're being opportunity for now. We think it'll be okay, but we're not sure. If I'm a teacher who's not that better, I'm going to go and get a job somewhere else. That's just kind of how that works. And so I hate to beat up a slightly hungry. Here's a fact. Schools are about the children. That's what school is about. It's not about, like right now, we've gone, it's not about the adults. It's about the kids. We just covered four categories, academics, budgets, facilities, and challenges. And when we're thinking of those, we were all thinking about it and how we're going to have to deal with these as adults, how we're going to deal with teachers, uh, board reps. But they are 100% child impact issues. So absolutely, I represent the children. That's what my job is. It's my job to make sure they have the best opportunities possible. But everything we discussed tonight, any one of those categories, the challenges, the academics, that 100% impacts our children. And for you, four pillars to be tied. I'm not going to put Terry on the spot. Four <laughs> pillars. And the first pillar, children first, always. We do things with children in the forefront of our mind. We create calendars with that. We do everything with children first. The second pillar is communication, which we've talked a lot about tonight, and the importance of it, making sure the correct information gets out here. The third pillar is professionalism. That's creating that culture of support and respect. And then, then, the last pillar is curriculum. And it seems crazy for a superintendent to put the last pillar, the curriculum to be the last pillar, but if you don't have those other three, that fourth one's meaningless. So this, is about kids, and that is our first step. So this, I think that's all I've got for you. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, Mr. Chair, I'm all set. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, very quickly, so we're going to be, this is not going to be but we're going to be actually heading shortly to the executive session, and we will not be coming out of that, so before we go ahead and do that, very quickly, I just want to, first of all, thank the facilities and the tech people. This is not the normal setup. Um, the stage, for instance, had to be built out. I, I had to took some time. Um, obviously, the tech stuff had to be set up for the situation. And the um, so thank you for that time. Uh, thank you, obviously, to uh, our school leaders and stuff. these team for being here tonight. Obviously, the selectmen uh, for coming tonight. And you guys all have enough meetings and things on your own, your own time to do. So joining us on Tuesday night, not necessarily the agenda. I think it was really helpful. Um, I think we might have some finance uh, committee members from respective towns and committees as well. So thank you for, for coming out as well. And for everybody else who came, um, I, you know, I think collectively, I don't want to speak for everybody, I, I think this was relatively enlightening. I think for some of us a little alarming um, and unsettling in some spots. Uh, but genuinely, I think understanding it together is a, obviously an important thing first step towards actually managing it together. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Just one question, that would be great. Sorry, I'm going back to Kathy's question about the five hundred forty-six thousand, about fourteen percent. But we're doing what we already spend right now on children, right? So that five that fourteen percent is what we actually we already pay out. The five forty-six is what we will actually cover. Yes, we'll pay that out in the That's right. But that also was transportation situation last year, but we just didn't know what it was going to be as a similar. Sorry, it's a big number, so I want to make sure we get that right. Uh, just on behalf of all the everyone here in the district, just all the boards, thank you so much for coming tonight. It really means a lot. I don't know the last time when we said it was 2019, but if you'd be here, I really appreciate it. And uh, anything, any questions you have, you know how to get hold of it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Again, I feel pretty good. Um, okay, with that, uh, I'm going to need a motion to uh, go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel, or to conduct a collective bargaining session for contract negotiations with non union personnel. So moved. Somebody second. All those in favor? Yes. Oh, sorry. Did you say anything? Wayne? Yes. Mama? Yes. Emily? Yes. Marie? Yes. Julie? Yes. 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 Yes.